San Francisco. I just got back, Jason and I, on Sunday night. We were able to go to their winter workshop, and it was so incredible, so inspiring. Um, the Thrive, uh, the Thrive Geographic churches are thriving, and you know, Jason and I were there for eight years in San Francisco, and we have so many relationships and memories. And so every time I spoke, I just cried. One day I will go there and not cry, but it was just, it was just awesome to be back and to see the church doing so well. And because we loved it so much, we just were like, please, Fernando and Jackie, go. And they were able to go and lead the church. I'm so grateful for their sacrifice. They've moved so much. They have three kids. Um, but they just, you know, once again, packed up and moved. And I'm so grateful for them. And they are taking the church to greater heights. And so your sister church in San Francisco sends greetings. But it's great to be with you guys tonight. Um, Sharon Kirshner, one of our shepherds, is flying back right now, so she's not with us. She was at the New York Winter Workshop, so she sends her love. And it's great to be here with the besties, with Amanda and Shay visiting. Pretty awesome. And it's great, of course, to be here with Regine and Selma Itha. And just everybody, I can't go about, I can't talk about everybody. <laughs> so grateful to be with you guys. But anyways, tonight, um, so remember how... When was the last time I preached to you guys? Well, I talked about um, a chapter in my book yeah. that I've been writing for years, I know. Well, just please pray for me. I have to finish this book. Anyways, I finally got chapter number two done, so I thought I'd talk to you guys about that tonight. So, and again, my book is called um, Sheba, which means seven, or it's complete in um, Hebrew, and so it's a book about complete spiritual healing, and it just talks about Mary Magdalene and how seven demons came out and infirmities, so she was, went from completely in the darkness to completely healed, and so we're going to talk about some of those demons, and so the title of the lesson tonight is The Demon of Spiritual Slumber. <laughs> So Frank Herbert said, without change, something sleeps inside us and seldom awakens. The sleeper must awaken. <laughs> you know, I love putting my kids to bed at night. It's just a treasured memory. It's so much fun. And though they never want to go to sleep, they always quickly fall asleep. <laughs> They're always exhausted. But their bedtime routine is usually pretty much the same every night. Though Mickey, he doesn't want to do it like this. He's getting older. Amen. But um, it starts off with cuddles, hugs, kisses. You know, um, we talk about their day. We pray. And then I sing songs. And Monty's favorite song, he always wants me to sing, Encourage My Soul. So I sing that song to him. And then he, he asked me... <laughs> He asked me to rub his back, and he likes it when I do the, like, the very soft, barely there that I'm like, I hate that. I'm like, oh, I just want to itch it. He loves that. So I do that, and this relaxes him. It comforts him. It calms him, and he just knocks out. <laughs> it just works like a charm every time. And my kiddo's bedtime routine reminds me of this scripture. Point number one, falling asleep. <laughs> So we're going to look at Judges chapter 16 and verse 1. So catch up with me. It says, one day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. Oops. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. And the rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him. So we may tie him and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, well, if anyone, tells, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried. And she tied them, she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to them, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when comes to a close flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, you've made a fool of me. You've lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, okay. 
If anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, all this time you've been making a fool of me, lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with the pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric and tightened with the pin. Again, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He woke from his sleep, pulled up the pin and loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, how can you say you love me when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you've made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging and prodding him day after day until he was sick to death of it. <laughs> so he told her everything. <laughs> no. He says, no razor has ever been used on my head. He said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines. Come back once more. He's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He woke from his sleep and thought, I'll just go out as before and shake myself free. But he didn't know that the Lord had left him. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> such a power. It's such a sobering passage. You see, just like I have a bedtime routine for my kids, Satan had a bedtime routine for Samson. You know, early in chapter 16, we see Samson make the devastating um, decision to be immoral with the woman, with the, with the prostitute. And sadly, he didn't repent of that, and he didn't guard his heart. And so he, the Bible says that some time later, he fell in love um, with Delilah, and he continued on in his immorality. And Satan worked through his new girlfriend, Delilah, who is the Philistine, so she's God's enemy. So he's not in a good spot at all, and especially when you're dating a non-Christian, you're not in a good spot. You know, when you start to make excuses and tell yourself it's okay, you just, you're not in a good spot. But she starts to overpower and subdue him spiritually once and for all. Samson knew that Delilah didn't love him back because she kept asking him what she could do to take his strength away. Isn't that weird? But he didn't care because his sin was so alive. <laughs> he cared more about his carnal needs than his spiritual needs. And she just kept nagging him and wearing him down spiritually. And while she was putting him to sleep, on her lap, he caved in, and he just told her everything. And then he fell asleep. While he was sleeping, Delilah got to work, and Samson was finally subdued by the Philistines. And this just, it's such a sad story. Yeah. This was a man chosen by God to be, you know, a, a, a prophet. Yeah. And I just think that we have to take heed to this scripture and to this story yeah. because it's a warning to us. It's a warning to us as disciples that the demon of spiritual slumber would love to find a way to coax each and every one of you to sleep as well. He's got a plan and he's waiting for the opportunity to lure you into your sin of choice. When you don't repent, he helps you get nice and comfortable. What does Satan do? He's like, come here. You're tired. Come lie in my lap. You lay down. And then what does Satan do? He starts to rub your back. He feels good. And he starts to introduce worldly comforts slowly into your life. Pleasures. Desires. And then you sin. And then you do it again. And after you continually sin over and over again, what happens? Your conscience starts to feel a little bit more relaxed. And what used to be, like, terrible is now the new norm. And then he starts to whisper in your ear, shh, just take it easy, it's okay. It's a spiritual battle, but just, just one night is okay. Just take a break, you're tired. You just need some R&R. &R. And you know what? You start to agree. 
Because you're like, yeah, you know what? I feel tired. I'm weary. I feel worn out spiritually. I do need a little bit of a break. And here's the thing. You've also been so exhausted emotionally, and you haven't gotten your strength in a while. So at that point, you're kind of primed and ready for Satan. And it's the perfect time for him to sing you a lullaby. You're in the right place spiritually for him to turn the lights off. And before you know it, he turns the light off and you're successfully asleep spiritually. Now, when you fall asleep like this, you may not notice it or people may not notice it right away. That's what's kind of intense, you know, because on the outside at times it can look like not a lot has changed because sometimes you can do some of the same things that you did when you weren't asleep. When people are physically asleep, they can do a lot of weird things. <laughs> they can walk in their sleep. You can even hear some things in your sleep that it, you know, plays in your head as you dream. You can, people can sing in their sleep. <laughs> in the same way, disciples can be asleep spiritually, yet still at times hear God maybe speaking to them. <laughs> they can even sing to God here on a Wednesday night because they're used to it. And they can go through the, the, you know, just walking the walk, just the motion of living like a Christian. Do you know what I mean? And just like you can do all these things when you're physically asleep, you can do all these things while still living a life of unrepentant sin. You know, the Bible warns us in 1 Corinthians 11, it talks about falling asleep. And um, I forget the verse, I think it's 39, but it talks about when you take communion. The Bible says don't, don't take communion in an unworthy manner. Right? So when we take communion, we are supposed to examine ourselves. And we're supposed to come to the foot of the cross, and we're supposed to think about our sin, and we're supposed to be repentant. And so there's times where I've not taken communion on a Sunday because I'm not repentant in my heart of bitterness towards my husband or something that day. You know? I've done it. Because I don't want to take communion in an unworthy way. Why? Because the Bible says if we do it over and over again, unrepentant, just going through the motions, we'll fall asleep spiritually. First you get weak and sick, and then you fall asleep, the Bible says. So there's a few sins that are biblically associated, actually, with falling asleep. Falling asleep can be falling into one of these sins. Now, for time's sake, this is in my book. I'm not going to talk about it tonight because there's so much to talk about. But, you know, drunkenness is a sin that can put you to sleep. Look it up, First lesson, First Thessalonians chapter 5, okay? The other one is impurity and immorality. Not confessed, unrepentant. Ephesians 5, that can put you to sleep too. But there's two things that I specifically want to talk about tonight. Two areas that we can fall asleep. One is living a life of comfort. This one is particularly insidious. Let's turn to Luke chapter 12, verse 15. You guys with me tonight? <sighs> okay. <laughs> Okay, Luke chapter 12, verse 15, the Bible says, Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possession. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns. I'll dig bigger ones. And there, I will store a surplus of grain. I'll say to myself, I, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Okay, so the Bible here, it tells us to watch out for comfort and acquiring wealth and worldly possessions, okay? And this man decided to, what was he focused on? He was focused on building his life and not the kingdom. He put his life, his wants, his needs over and above building God's kingdom. And his whole goal, this is the problem, his whole goal was comfort, okay? He wanted to take life easy. But then sadly one night while he was sleeping, and I believe he was also asleep spiritually, his life was taken from him. See, that's the danger of falling asleep in this state, is that if you're not careful, you'll also die spiritually. That's where it leads to. Now, 
comfort's not all bad, okay? Sometimes it's okay to be comfortable. I'm not saying that it's always, I mean, I love comfort. I love comfort food. We all have our comfort food. I'm from the Midwest. I'm from South Dakota. So y'all know I know how to make meatloaf. And I love it. I love meatloaf. I'm proud of it, okay? Come to my house, you'll get some meatloaf. Here's the thing. You know when you go to people's houses and there's that casserole? Like my husband, it like freaks him out. I love it. I love me some Midwestern casseroles. It's comfort, comfort food for me. My kids love it too, thankfully. But yeah, and I love to come home, you know, when it's like, you're, it's late and you're tired and what do you wanna do? You just wanna put on your fuzzies. I just wanna put on my fuzzy socks and my fuzzy pants. I wanna get comfortable. So comfort's not all bad. There's a time and a place for it. But the problem, what I'm talking about is the problem with comfort is when you make it your goal and your life's ambition. You know what I mean? You know, this is crazy. A study was conducted at the University of Cal Berkeley in in San Francisco, and what it did is it looked at um, tiny single-celled organisms called amoebas, okay, for all the college students out there. So in this experiment, um, the scientists made the little amoebas in the petri dish really comfortable. So what they did is they took away all the stressors of their environment to see what would happen. And they measured the results of this worry-free life. Can you guess what happened? They died. (laughs) These little amoebas died. Turns out we all need a little bit of stress in our life. (laughs) But it's interesting because just like the rich man's quest to take life easy led to his spiritual death, the easy and stress-free life of the amoebas led to their death as well. And if we're not careful, if we're not focused on building up God's kingdom and instead we run after our own comfort, it's going to eventually cause us to fall asleep and die spiritually. Now, the second thing that I think can put us to sleep spiritually is staying weary. So... It's not, I'm not saying being weary, okay? Because we all have times where we're weary. That's a normal emotion. I'm saying we cannot stay there. Because when you allow yourself to stay there, that spiritual slumber can take hold of you. And when you find yourselves there too long, you know, you become weary for good. And so the word weary, what is weary? It means to become emotionally fatigued or discouraged to the point where you lose heart or you give up. Now imagine having this heart, but still coming to church all the time. That's so, that's so sad. And there's many prophets in the Bible who, um, who, who wrestled with this, and it led to them falling asleep. So we can't talk about all of them, but let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. Okay, in verse, it's like cold up here. It's like, oh, my hands are like freezing. Okay, Sorry. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush, and he fell asleep. Here, Elijah was running from Jezebel. Okay, He was running for his life. And he's just like, I'm done. I've had enough. And he just spewed out all his frustrations and he fell asleep. Okay? And I believe it means spiritually. And then, of course, the other prophet that maybe you think of is Jonah. You remember Jonah? God told him, go preach to the Ninevites. And they're this wicked people. And he was just like, oh, I don't want to do that. And he got ticked off and angry. You know? And then he just decided it was too much. And he ran away from God. And in his discouragement and not doing God's will, losing heart, getting weary, he fell asleep, the Bible says, in Jonah chapter 1, verse 5. And then, of course, there's the apostles with Jesus, right, at Gethsemane. Remember that? Jesus is like, please stay awake with me just for one hour. Now, they couldn't do it. Why? Because they were so deeply wearied. And they were wearied because of bad news. Their hearts were hurting. And so they just couldn't stay awake. And sisters, the question is, can you relate to any of these symptoms of sleepiness that I just talked about? Have you maybe been weary for a long time? 
from a broken heart, you know, maybe your life is broken. It's not the way you wanted it or you thought it would be. Maybe you're saddened by the world or just bad news. Or maybe you're discouraged because of constant change or just transitions that happen. Maybe you're weary from, you know, just not bearing fruit in a while. Um, Maybe you're weary because you see unrepentant and, you know, uncontested sin of others or yourself. Maybe you're weary because of the pressure to evangelize the world and all that that entails. (laughs) Special, I mean, we can just become weary by the pressure at times of these things. Or maybe your true God is comfort. When it's all said and done, what you're really going after is comfort. You don't like the discomfort at times of being sold out. You don't like this, but you know you don't want to leave it because you don't want to, you don't want to not make it to heaven, but you're not really living like a disciple, like a true disciple. And some of you, there's just, here's the thing, there's just unconfessed sin. And that's why tonight we're going to do the D groups. But disciples who find themselves in this state for a long period of time will eventually fall asleep spiritually. And and here's the thing. If I'm honest, I think that a lot of disciples fell asleep during the pandemic. I did. I know I did for for a time. I don't know how long, maybe like a week or two. I fell asleep for sure. It was difficult. And L.A. had Zoom recovery. Remember that? And um, I think for some of us, we never fully came out of the pandemic. That mindset, that lifestyle. Maybe you're still coming to the meetings of the body. Well, most of them. I mean, the ones you missed, you feel like you had a really good excuse. But you haven't come back fully and you're asleep. And you know who you are. There are some people in this room who are fully asleep. And I want to talk especially to the marriage ministry tonight. Because we're family. Can we talk? Hey. So at staff yesterday, Jason talked about some of the statistics, and they don't always lie, right? Statistics, they're numbers. Like Jason always says, there's a book in the Bible called Numbers, so we should look at it, okay? In the beginning of 2023, we had 389 campus students, and by the end of the year, there was 340 baptized campus students. That's pretty awesome. (laughs) That's a lot of campus students. Some of you guys are in this room, which is awesome. Now, the beginning of 2023, there was 322 singles. And by the end, there was 133 baptisms. It's pretty awesome. The teens. Do we have any teens tonight? Okay. Okay, one or two. Okay. So there was 31 teens, and the teens baptized 26 other teens. Isn't that awesome? I'm actually really fired up about that. Now, the marriage ministry, there's 286. And in one year, there was only 24 baptisms. That's pretty scary. Now, here's the thing. I do think some of the marrieds help baptize singles. Amen. Or campus. So there is that, okay? There's a lot of that. And maybe this doesn't pertain to you. So amen. Um, But also, some of the campus, the singles, baptize a lot of the marrieds. So what does that say? It's a major drop-off. What this says is that a lot of our marrieds ministry needs to be awakened. The solution to a spiritual slumber, and point number two, my last point, is to wake up. (laughs) Now, when I was a kid, I remember having weird dreams, unpleasant, kind of scary dreams, and I don't know if you guys could do this, but I could kind of like will myself to wake up. Do you know what I, okay, good, because I talked to Mickey, and he's like, no, like, okay, sorry. Maybe I didn't do that, maybe. But I thought I did. I think I could do that when I was a kid. Well, I want to look at a church that needed to wake itself up as well. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. It's a little salty tonight, but it is also just a Bible study. I mean, it's just the Bible. So let's just look at it. Okay, verse 1 says, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you've received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. 
Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. And I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will encourage that name before my father and his angels. So that last part is just really encouraging. <laughs> but this little church in Sardis was sleepy. And the, the thing is, is that it was once um, a zealous, fired up, strong church. Committed, known for its faithful deeds, bearing fruit all over the world. But their pride and in their complacency, they started to rest on the past and what they had done in the past. And they started to get easy. And they started to believe the hype. And just, you know, that's what it always is going to be. And so they stopped really seeing where they were at. They still did some of the, dece- the deeds that, you know, a discipling church would do. Um, but it wasn't enough because the Bible says it was unfinished. Their deeds were unfinished. They could have done more. They weren't doing the deeds that really made them faithful. You know what I mean? And they needed to be strengthened up. They needed to be wakened up by being strengthened through repentance. Their clothes were once white like their lives were once radical, but now their clothes and deeds have become muddied by sin. And it's very hard to wake people up in a deep sleep. I don't know if you have family members that sleep deeply. I'm actually... I'm a pretty deep sleeper. Jason wakes up really late, so, but I'm a pretty deep sleeper. But, you know, how do you wake them up? It, it Maybe a loud alarm going off. I was at the winter workshop, Jackie, I was like, how are you doing? She said, I'm so tired. I'm like, why? She's like, because the teen, her, she has two teen dis- disciples, daughters. She's like, they set the alarm for like five and they kept hitting snooze till seven. She's like, I just couldn't go back to bed. Like, it's terrible. Especially when we're going to bed at like one at every night at the workshop, you know? But, you know, it's hard to wake people up if it's not an alarm, then maybe yelling in their ear, you know, like, wake up! Or if that doesn't work, then it's throwing water on their faces. Maybe you've seen stuff like that. But these uncomfortable deeds are what it takes to shock the system to wake up. In the same way, disciples and sometimes churches are in a spiritual slumber, and the only way to wake them up is to defibrillate them with deeds you got to defibrillate yourself by being radical. That's really the only way. And whether a whole church needs a change or an individual needs awakening, there's a couple things that will help you wake up. One, and this is like like new. Like you guys have never heard this before. I promise you. Confess your sin. Like, okay, but do you do it? I mean, not just at like a midweek when you have to do it in your D group and like, oh, okay, let me just say a few things so I can just go under the radar. Nobody, no, 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 no. Do you confess your sin regularly? I want to lift up Regine. Regine sends me her sin list every Sunday. It's pretty awesome. And not only that, she, she regularly confesses her sin. This is a righteous woman who's walking in the light. Ephesians 5 verse 11. Let's look at this real quick we got to confess our sins, guys. You look the worst, you grow the most. Okay? Why am I still here 20 years later? It's not, I just, I'm just open. I don't care about my position. I care about my walk with God. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just want to be, I just want to make it to heaven. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Let's expose them tonight. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that's illuminated becomes a light. That's why it says, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Tonight, we're going to get into D groups. And I want to encourage you. Maybe you came into, into the meeting tonight. You're like, I'm not going to get open. Change your mind and make the decision to walk in the light. It's going to help you to wake up, oh sleeper. Number two, this is another thing you've never heard. You've never heard of this before, so write it down. I don't care if you've been a disciple for five years, 10 years, 20, you've never heard. Repent. I know. I know. It's crazy. (laughs) But you actually have to stop sinning. You just have to stop. You know, the Bible says in, um, what is it? First Chronicles 16, 9 that, um, you know, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed. You may feel like, I can't repent. 
I can't, I can't do this thing, the disciple. I can't. No, no, no. You just make a decision to commit and God will strengthen you. Isn't that awesome? And the call for tonight is repentance. If I may, I want to read a few scriptures back to back because the Bible is our medicine. The Bible is the water, that cold water on our head. Are you guys with me? It's that, that yelling in our ear. That's the Bible. It's that alarm clock. This is the alarm clock, okay? Romans chapter 13, verse 11. It says, and do this. So if we, what we read right here, this is the call to obey. And do this, understanding the present time, sisters. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because the salvation is nearer now than when we first believe. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let's put aside the deeds of darkness. Let's put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissensions and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't think about how to gratify the desires of your flesh. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Here the Bible calls us to repent, to put aside the deeds of darkness, those deeds that put you to sleep. And once you repent, you got to start doing the things you did at first. What are those things you did at first? Remember when you got up super early before it was still dark? And you're like, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Yeah, you can. You can actually do that now. Jesus called you to be a disciple. And he wouldn't call you if you couldn't do it. Remember when you were so excited about the Bible and you actually had a notebook and you took and you're like, yeah, but I, it's not what, it, yeah, you can do it. Get a new notebook. I got a pink one. <laughs> I love it. And I got a new Bible. It's a pink one. I'm so excited. So every year I get new stuff. It's really fun. Remember when you shared your faith every day? Remember? You can do it. God will give you the words to say. And you're in Bible studies, and you didn't get bitter about giving, and you just didn't get bitter at anything. You're so far out, but you saw God all the time. Remember that? You can be that again. We got to do the things we did at first. Because when you get up in the morning, what did you do? You got dressed. That's what you did at first. In the same way, the Bible says we got to clothe ourselves with Christ. Let's close out in 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm just going to read this. We're just going to read the Bible tonight, okay? Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. And they will not escape. But you, sisters, are not in the darkness. So that this day should surprise you. Isn't that encouraging? You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the, lay, the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love and hope as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. I love this passage because this is the key to how to wake up. And you know what's crazy? This church was heavily persecuted. And this was the call. The call was to wake up. It's, it's funny, I think God was actually trying to wake them up through persecution. You know, sometimes when there's persecution in the church or in the movement, God's trying to wake us up. The Bible says here that the clothes we put on are faith. It's time to have a great quiet time tomorrow. Time to get those notebooks, those journals, those new Bibles going for the new year. And it's time to recommit to being discipled and having our faith really grow. Love, it's time to love each other and love the lost. And the hope of salvation, it's time to work out our salvation through prayer and through fasting. You know, real quick, I just want to share. I'm closing out, I promise. <laughs> no time it is. But um, there, was, there was quite a few people who walked away this year. And it really hurt my heart because I knew a lot of them personally. And I saw them fall asleep spiritually. And they just walked away. And then you know what's really interesting? I would see them just come back and hang out. How do you do that? You know why? Because they've been doing that for years. 
They were asleep. It was normal. You know, there was a, there's a sister who I love deeply. She's an intern. She said I could share. Um, she said I could put it in, her, in my book. And she's shared for communion. So there it is, okay? But her name is Kirsten Mejia. And I love this sister deeply. And this last year, she had to get restored. But what's really interesting about her is, as an intern in the church, dating, she fell away. She fell asleep and she fell away. So she was um, living in unconfessed immorality for six months. And during that time, she wasn't having quiet time. She wasn't praying. She was guilty the whole time. Yes, she was baptizing people. Yes, she was. And they're still saved. God used her. But she was not a disciple. She was sleeping all day because she was with him all night. And she looked dead, right? You remember? She looked dead on the outside. She would just say, yeah, my mental health. But it wasn't. She was spiritually dead. And this is what she told me. She said, I knew I was spiritually asleep when the church hit a thousand and I didn't care. She was made a sector leader and she didn't have any feelings about it. Now, she knew it was time to get open and so she got open, praise God. (laughs) And so me and Daniela got with her and we did a lot of Bible studies and her heart just softened. And you know what she did that was so crazy and revolutionary? She confessed and she repented. And she became brand new. Okay? That simple. And she's doing phenomenal to this day. And I'm just so proud of her. Guys, it, if you can relate at all to anything I've shared tonight, if you feel like, oh, maybe I am a little bit of sleep or I'm sleepy or maybe I've fallen asleep. Maybe I'm dead. I don't know. If you can relate to this, just, just get open. Yeah. There's hope. You can, be, you can actually live a life of a Christian be happy and joyful and love it. And it's not that hard. It's fun. Sadly, the church in Sardis didn't repent. You know how I know that? Where are they? None of the churches in Revelations are here to this day. Maybe you're visiting tonight and you're like, whoa. (laughs) Is this okay? Welcome to our family night. I hope you come back. (laughs) Especially since we're doing D groups. But um, but, um, maybe you're like, no, I'm just, I'm asleep. I'm dead. Okay, we'll just do Bible studies. Guess what? I was. I was dead in the world in my sin. But you can be alive. (laughs) To close out, remember the whole reason why we're doing this because Jesus is coming back. Mark Mark 13, 34 says, it's like a man going astray. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task. And he tells one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. Sisters, if the demon of spiritual slumber has put you to sleep, the call for tonight is to wake up. I love you. Thanks for having me.